this is going to be a combination uh, session because first we will have a presentation of the World Bank's some some relevant findings from the World Bank's new World Development Report, which is our major annual research document, and this year it's on jobs. And then I'm very fortunate to have with me a very distinguished panel. And we are going to put our panelists a bit on the spot to try and address some of the questions based both on the slides, but also on their very rich experience and knowledge that comes from there. So I will first introduce the panelists, and then I will um, invite our major speaker uh, who will make the presentation. Um, so with, with me today here on the podium, um, are uh, our four colleagues who um, will be the panelists. Starting from my, my left to your right, we have Kalpana Kocha, who is the chief economist for the South Asian region for the World Bank. Um, to her right, uh, your left, uh, is Abdullah Al-Denami, who is the acting management director of the Social Fund for Development in Yemen. Um, next to him, uh, is Mr. Castro Tsulka, and he is the Deputy Minister of Labor in uh, the Ministry of Labor, Social Affairs, and Equal Opportunities in Albania. And last but not least, to my left, your right, uh, and uh, Mr. Tsulka's right, um, is Andrew Teme, who is also Deputy Minister, uh, but in the Ministry of Gender and Development in Liberia. And we will ask the panelists to, in a few minutes, to give their reflections to some of the questions. But before that, let me welcome to the podium Jesko Henschel. Uh, Jesko, as he comes up, let me tell you, is uh, for the World Bank currently the director in charge of human development issues in the entire South Asia region. But uh, over the last year, he has also been one of the principal authors and deputy director of the new World Development Board of Jobs. And therefore, we asked Jesko to come in and give us a little overview of how the WDR saw the jobs agenda and how that might influence our discussions over the next few days. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you so much, the distinguished panel. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and see so many friends actually from different parts of the world who came together. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and talk a little bit about this World Development Report on Jobs, which we just released about two weeks ago. Um, the, the WDR, in general, tries to take the topic and then change the optic a little bit uh, as to how we look at it. So if you look at the World Development Reports over the last couple of years on conflict, gender, and now jobs, that's really what we try to do. And I hope for your deliberations for the next couple of days, to present some findings and some thoughts which you might be able to take up and which might enrich your discussion. Um, it, it is great to have this in a conference in, in Hyderabad, as the, the speakers at the, in the morning uh, already said. And I, I was uh, uh, very pleased to both hear the Honorable Minister talk about a couple of the really important big Indian programs, which I think are very important for all of us to look at, and study, and learn from, and also to hear from uh, Vinanabin uh, about uh, Seva's view of jobs and work and employment. And we were very fortunate in the World Development Report to have El Abad, the president of Seva, in our advisory council, as well as uh, Gordana Matkovic, who is uh, actually here from Serbia and representing the, the Serbian uh, delegation. So without further ado, what are some of the main messages coming out of this year of thinking which we have done for the world? First, very often when we think about jobs and employment, we think about those first and jobs second. If you read the newspapers pretty much everywhere in the world, the headlines and the financial page will be, well, growth is 5% and these many jobs were created. And what we came to believe after this year is that that's not the whole truth, but actually jobs themselves drive development. 
Jobs drive poverty reduction. Jobs themselves drive productivity increases. And jobs are fundamental for how people live and work together, as we heard in the morning, both from the Honorable Minister as well as from the Renan Bay. Second, if we look at a, at a longer time period, we actually see that developmental growth goes hand in hand with job creation. So the, there is this notion we often hear about of jobless growth is something which really happens in crisis. But over a longer period of time, overall the number of jobs follow pretty much the, uh, the, the growth rate. And just one question, could you put the slides on the screen? Oh, they are. Oh, okay, on these ones, which I can't see. Great, because I just saw this outside of all of them. Well, I'm going to talk for half an hour about this one slide. <laughs> um, uh, so very happy that you, that you see them. However, and this goes to the theme which I just mentioned, jobs have more, are more than an individual value. It's more than individual income or individual satisfaction. It, jobs actually have a social value, a developmental value. And for public policy makers like uh, yourselves, it's really important to bring up that developmental value in jobs. Third, job challenges really vary a lot between different countries. And rather than talking about South Asia and Latin America, what we're trying to come up with is actually thinking through jobs challenges in terms of the resource endowments which countries have, the demographic changes which we've already heard about from, from one of um, in the in the morning itself, and also the institutional development, for example, if the country is in a conflict situation or not. And lastly, and this marries, uh, this uh, goes very much to what Renata then said in the morning. When we looked at evaluation studies over the last 10 years, we actually find that labor policies proper, so labor regulation, minimum wages, they tend to matter much less than we think they do. So their impact on improving employment, on job creation, tends to be much more modest than exactly the type of policies which Renata Ben mentioned, uh, municipal policies, agricultural policies, infrastructure, tend to be the drivers of job creation themselves. Some figures to start with, and I could have added one more uh, one more point to these main messages, which would be informal is normal, which again goes very much to Renata Ben's intervention in the morning. Most people in most countries work in self-employment, in micro-enterprises, in the urban informal sector, or in small-scale farming. And in this slide, you see that for South Asia, for example, of uh, women, about 50% are in the self-employment and farming activities, and only half of them are in wage employment. And of that half, the majority are without a contract and without social protection. So when we think about policies and programs for job creation, we need to take this informal sector, these self-employed and farmers into account. Second, demographic changes are vast, but they differ a lot. In South Asia, as we have heard in the morning, there is about one million young people coming to the labor market every month. In Europe and Central Asia, as you see in this slide, this is exactly the reverse. There's actually no net increase of the labor force. And very soon, the labor force, the people aged 15 to 64, will be declining. So the pressures and policies are very different. On the right-hand side, you see some statistics on youth employment. And here, what we're focusing on are Youth unemployment, something we hear about in the press pretty much every day. But the larger part, the light yellow part, are young people who are neither in employment, nor in education, nor in training, nor looking for a job. So these are, there's an acronym called NEEDS, neither in employment, education, or training. So these are people who are really not in the labor force at all. And in some countries, like you see here in Pakistan or Turkey, <coughs> Inactivity numbers 
of especially young females between 15 and 24 are much higher than youth unemployment figures. So youth unemployment does not tell us everything. The first part of the report then talks about this transformative power of jobs, the link between jobs and development itself. And um, this is probably the, one of the most important uh, uh, graphics in this report to see what we were thinking about, namely that jobs and development are linked through three different pillars. You can see jobs at the bottom and development at the top to bring out this idea that jobs are so important for development, for living standards, how people get out of poverty, for productivity of countries, in that jobs themselves increase productivity, skills in jobs drive firms' productivity. The reallocation of jobs between a low productivity firm and a high productivity firm drives growth. And third, and importantly, social cohesion. And what we mean with social cohesion is the way groups in countries work and live together. So the ability of countries to manage tensions in a peaceful way. So it's not the concept of social cohesion where uh, everybody is quiet and doesn't have a voice. It's the opposite. It is accountability and voice being managed through institutional development that is positive. And we know how much jobs influence ourselves, how much jobs are important for our identity, and how much jobs actually shape the way we interact with each other. One slide, or two slides, we need to please. First, we have looked in living standards at, well, what is the important of jobs to take people out of poverty? We've collected data from across the world and followed the same families over time. And you see in this slide that from Costa Rica to the United Kingdom, jobs are the major effect, the major cause for people to rise out of poverty. And that can be by another family member getting a job, by a job paying more money. There's different possibilities, but these events are the major cause for poverty reduction. So when we think about programs and policies, jobs are key to improving people's welfare. Now, a core cool theme for us is, and I mentioned that at the beginning, that not every job is alike. A job that takes a person out of poverty has a higher social developmental value than a job that doesn't. A job that brings women into the labor force very often has a very high developmental value. And why? Because female earnings tend to be spent differently than earnings of men. Female earnings tend to be spent on education, on health, and on nutrition. So there is an impact of female labor earnings on the next generation. So two jobs are not the same, and there is a developmental value attached to female labor force participation. But also earning of others. Very often we think about, uh, for example, think about the ex-Soviet Union where you have mono-industrial towns where really the individual worker has no power and no possibility to determine in a collective bargaining sense that their wage. So in these situations where wages are repressed, there's a difference between the individual income of the worker and also the value that worker produces. Again, two jobs are not the same. Now let me move to productivity. What we've done here is we've collected data from farm surveys from around the world. And we have looked at, well, how does productivity actually change in farms? And the most important finding is that when we focus on net employment changes, very often, you know, the headline in the, in the, in the, in the journals, we miss the dynamic which is happening in all countries. So the, the rate of job creation and job destruction is much, much higher than the net employment effect this creation and this destruction has. Look at the figures on the, or the bars on the left-hand side here where the light blue is job, gross job destruction and white is, is, is creation and the dark blue is the difference between the two. 
That process of creative destruction really determines how productivity changes. So the question is whether that process leads firms that are really on the, on, on the lower side of productivity to shift jobs to those firms and sectors that have higher productivity. And that process in many developing countries does not work right. So we have a lot of churning. We have large amounts of creation and destruction without productivity being increased. And I'm sure this is in many of the countries you're familiar with, a large part of that comes from micro-enterprises dying and, and, and being born again without a positive productivity effect happening at the same time. In industrial countries, and so there's a lot of studies on the United States, that process of creation and destruction drives productivity positively forward. In many developing countries, that does not happen. So, who creates jobs? And this is one of the questions we're discussing everywhere. Is it the large enterprises or the small enterprises? And what we've done is we've looked at, we've combined household surveys and firm surveys to find out who really creates jobs. Very often we think it's small and medium-sized enterprises. And that is actually not true. It's micro-enterprises. A lot of the, the, this gross creation happens in very, very small firms, often only a firm of the owner itself. Again, this process of creative destruction in many countries does not create them firms, the gazelles, which are able to grow over time. And we've done some work on Chile, you know, pretty, uh, within the, within the, it's a member of the OECD, within Latin America, probably one of the countries that has had the, the best economic performance. And even in Chile, most of the jobs are being created in micro-enterprises, which goes back to the Nana Bay's point, we need to look at the small firms. Now, how does productivity change? How do firms grow? And there are two effects which bring me back to the theme that one job is not equal to the other. The first is agglomeration effects. So think about all the positive effects which cities can bring, but need not bring. Cities tend to bring people together. They lower transport costs. They make skills more readily available. They lower input prices. And very importantly, people learn from each other. This is why if you go to from New York to many, to many cities in India, you have the same type of firms being in a cluster together because people actually learn from each other and the technology they are using. In many developing countries, cities do not function in that way. They don't bring out these positive and accumulation effects. Second, global integration drives firm productivity. Firms that export, import are open to technology tend to have productivity increases through learning, which is higher than other firms. Let's go to my third P, the social cohesion one. Here we looked at is how do jobs influence how people feel, how they act, their norms and behaviors. We've taken value surveys from across the world and we have correlated how jobs impact on the active membership of people in societies, if they are active in their community, in their church, in a political organization, in all types of positive, constructive ways. And we find a very strong correlation between having a job and being active in these associations, on the one hand side, and we find a very positive correlation between jobs and trusting in other people, which I'm not showing here. So the bars you see in this graph are the precision of our estimate and you see that most of these little diamonds are actually far below or far above the zero line, which means there is something significant here. Now, if jobs change behaviors, if jobs form the way we interact, if they are the, one of the core pillars of social fabrics, then the way we think about jobs, namely just about income and social benefits, needs to be expanded. We need to have a much broader view of jobs, which again goes to what we heard in the morning from Dinana Bay. Correlations are not causality. It can also be that people have jobs uh, because they trust me or because they are more active. 
So we tried in Indonesia to go deeper, and we looked and we followed families and households over time. And between 2000 and 2007, in this panel survey following the same households, we actually find really the causal relationship between what's happening with jobs and in the labor market and what's happening in terms of people participating in society, which is shown in this graph. So what are these channels through which jobs impact the social fabric of society? First is social identity, the way we, we feel, the way we are self-confident and we approach our environment. Second are networks. How do we get jobs? Do jobs connect us positively to information? And third, a very important fact, is fairness. In many of these value surveys which I talked about, people were asked, well, in your country, how are jobs actually distributed? Do you need to know the son of your neighbor's school friend? <laughs> so are jobs distributed through connections, or are they distributed through marriage? And a lot of the times how people feel about fairness in the labor market, whether they get a job or not, determines how they feel about society overall. So again, jobs and the attitudes jobs create are important for how society functions. Now, what are then good jobs for development? And for good jobs of development, we mean those that bring about these positive, positive development jobs. We did a survey in four countries for this World Development Report in, we, in which we asked people is that, exactly that question. What do you think is a good job for you? And what do you think is a good job for society? And then we, we map these, which you find in this graph. So you have on the vertical axis the social value, and on the horizontal axis, the individual value. So these little dots, if they are on the line, then people say, well, the individual and the social value is pretty much the same. However, most of the dots are quite far away from the line. So we asked about civil servants in blue, doctors in red, farmers in green, shop owners in yellow, and teachers in, in black. And you see that, for example, a shop owner tends to have a pretty high individual value, but a relatively smaller social value. Civil servants, on the other hand, tend to have, in China, quite a high value. So China, China, in China itself, a civil servant is viewed as, some, as a job that provides a, kind of a, public, a public good itself. You can uh, follow the, the teachers or the doctors, and it's interesting that in Egypt, for example, the, the teachers uh, do not tend to have a social value which is, which is higher than the individual one, which might be understandable thinking about what happened in this country. So all of us have this notion of a difference between the individual and the social value. So if we put this together with the, these three pillars I showed you at the beginning, for public policy, this would mean, well, how do we bring about jobs that empower women, that are for the poor, that happen in functional cities, that connect to global markets, that give a sense of fairness and that shape social identity in a positive way. Rather than, as I mentioned at the beginning, then going to different regions and saying Latin America and South Asia, we went for different jobs challenges. And I'd be very interested to hear from the panel later on uh, whether this resonates uh, uh, or not to, to them as practitioners. We distinguish these typologies or this challenge by three factors, resources, demographics, and institutions. And we came up with agrarian economies. Most of the population is in smallholder farming. No country in the world has had a successful development and growth success without increasing productivity in smallholder farming to reduce poverty. Poverty reduction in East Asia happened through land redistribution and increases in rural productivity. In these countries then, more productive smallholder farming from a good job for development perspective needs to be at the forefront of policy makers. Second are conflict affected countries. I was in Afghanistan a couple of weeks ago where in Kabul about half of the population is in Kabul today because of security concerns in the provinces. 
So how to create a safe environment and especially how to integrate those that have fought into peaceful activities through jobs becomes absolutely crucial. We have some examples from Rwanda where a demobilization program had very positive effect on that social reintegration. Urbanizing countries are those that see a rapid shift from rural to urban areas and where bringing out these agglomeration economies is absolutely key, where functional cities produce high productivity itself. Very often, female labor force participation, so providing opportunities for women, but also moving up the export level. So from this region would be Bangladesh, example of the textile manufacturing sector, which has been extraordinarily successful, but how does Bangladesh now go from textile to pharmaceuticals or other value, uh, higher value added production? Resource rich countries have a specific challenge because very often the resource abundance can be curse, namely then if the money rents are distributed in a not transparent and unfair way, or if an exchange in appreciation actually creates a job situation where some have very, very high paying jobs in the resource extraction sector, and you have a very strong public sector, but there is no development of the diversification of a manufacturing industry. And many countries stand for that. The example we have in the WDR is on Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea will have a natural gas investment of 200% of GDP over the next couple of years, which will create a total of 1,000 jobs. So the challenges for resource-rich countries are huge, and good jobs from a developmental perspective would be those that are supporting export diversification, for example, as Chile has done, and those that are not subsidized to transfers. Next come small island nations, and very often in the Pacific and the Caribbean, it, it's not only a small island itself, but very often these small islands are uh, themselves composed of hundreds of islands. Think of the Maldives, for example. So the effects which I talked about earlier of agglomeration, of bringing people together, can simply not happen. Migration, creating knowledge links, integrating into the global economy, for example, through tourism, are good jobs in this development sense that can bring positives below us. Then come countries with high youth unemployment, a big, big question and also problem in many countries. Very often, our initial instinct is to say, well, if we have high youth unemployment, it must be the problem of the training and skill system. But this need not be the case. It depends very much what signals the skill and education system is being sent through public policies. And if we take, for example, quite some countries in the Middle East and in North Africa, the high youth unemployment, especially of higher education graduates, comes from earlier policies which guaranteed university graduates a public sector job. So what we would think is a problem just of the education and skill system can very well be in other areas as well, in public policies in terms of private sector development and also growing the public sector itself. Formalizing countries, especially in Latin America, but also Turkey, the big question becomes, how do you expand social protection without disincentivizing people to take up formal sector jobs? Do we create the difference between the informal and the formal job through social insurance and social protection systems? How can that be made more universal? So jobs with affordable social benefits and that are not creating gaps in social protection coverage are actually good jobs for development. And lastly, Asian societies, I mentioned earlier, Europe and Central Asia, one of our case studies is Ukraine, where the population now is already 7 million lower than in 1990, and it will shrink by another 7 million over the next 10 to 15 years. A declining workforce, which has an enormous pressure on living standards and also on productivity. So how can we think about policies in this uh, given this typology? And we have a, a policy pyramid in the World Development Report, which has three layers. One is fundamental. So these are really policies 
which every country needs to do independent of this jobs challenge. And these are the ones we very often talk about, but it is important to remind ourselves that they are absolutely fundamental for job creation and bringing out these good jobs for the macroeconomic stability and an enabling business environment, human capital, absolutely core of providing both non-cognitive and cognitive skills so that people can actually learn later on in life. And the rule of law and respect for rights. Now, respect for rights for us here is very important. Our definition of jobs is a remunerative activity, any work that pays either in cash or in kind, for example, that includes farm labor, family labor, all that are jobs. However, we exclude those jobs that violate human rights from our definition. So work that violates human rights. So bonded labor, slave labor, any types of involuntary labor, uh, work that discriminates, uh, if collective bargaining is, cannot take place. All these parts for us are violation of rights and we uh, think that this is a fundamental, uh, a fundamental policy to adhere to, to uh, human rights in the labor space. The second are labor policies. So this is regulation, minimum wages, but also collective bargaining. And I'll talk a little bit about this in, in a second. And lastly come the priorities to bring out these good jobs for development. Let me go into labor market institutions with one slide, and I mentioned this before. We've looked at evaluations for the last 10 years, and we find that within a reasonable range, labor market regulations have relatively modest impact on employment and productivity. Again, mirroring exactly what none of them said in the morning. So we actually can think about regulations and minimum wages as being on a, on a plateau with, with cliffs. On, on both sides, to minimum regulation, which tries to really deal with labor market imperfections, but then also on the other side, one where it really becomes binding. And one of the, the binding regulations we talk about is, is India's uh, IDA uh, Act from 1947, where there's quite a few studies which show that here labor market regulations are so binding that they hinder the creation of foreign sector firms. But most countries tend to be in this plateau, which automatically means that the Policies and programs for good job creation are somewhere else. They are in organization, they can be with active labor market programs, but they are somewhere else than in the labor regulation space itself. We do talk about voice quite a bit, inspired also by our conversations with El Abad. The share of people in the developing world that is part of formal sector unions is extremely small. New forms of voice, especially in the informal sector, be it, say, be it uh, uh, garbage collectors in Colombia, be it informal sector organizations in Durban, have the possibility to improve lives significantly when we have quite a bit on that organization of new forms of voice. Active labor market programs. And a good part of what we will be discussing over the next days will be on these programs. They can be part of the priority, but what I would, what I would uh, perhaps uh, think it might be interesting for you to do is think about when these labor active labor market programs make sense in what type of setting for which people. Overall, they have positive impacts, but they can only be part of the solution. As Linara Ben said in the morning, if we don't have organization functioning in a positive way, if we don't have labor markets, housing work, if we don't have credit, then active labor market policies can only be part of the solution, but not the whole solution itself. Job search tends to have a high impact, but it, you need to have jobs in order to have job search facilities and employment offices to work well. Wage subsidies tend to be very costly. They can be effective if they are well targeted, but often the costs are hidden. And if we take them into account, the cost-benefit ratio becomes extremely small, if not negative. Public works, and we heard from the Honorable Minister in the morning about the UN Regal program, public works are a fundamental safety net. Very seldom public works lead to sustainable employment. And only the very new generation that links public works with skill building and training, and especially life skill training, public works can have a more lasting impact itself. 
Training overall has a very mixed record. And especially if training is done without the private sector and in isolation, training returns can be very low for job creation. And to give you one slide here, which shows how important training is if combined with other interventions. In-class training alone, this is evaluations from across the world, actually do not tend, tend to have a low or even negative uh, a, a return in terms of helping people find jobs. But look at the very right side. In-class training together with workplace training, so the whole idea of apprenticeships uh, comes in here, as well as training combined with other services, individual counseling. Yes, they can be positive, but again, jobs need to be there. On social insurance, and this is what I wanted to, to uh, leave you with uh, in terms of the substance discussion here. Uh, managing risks goes outside uh, the, the labor market, so health and early age, but also inside in terms of job transitions um, are, are important. And very often countries link these outside and inside insurance mechanisms to the labor market problem. However, coverage is linked to this labor market status in most countries. And that coverage is very low. During the financial crisis, only 15% of the unemployed obtained an unemployment benefit. The core question hence becomes, how can coverage be extended to the non-cover, to the unorganized sector, as Renata said in the morning. Uh, on a voluntary basis, obviously voluntary has a question itself because insurance markets don't function well in if it's voluntary, then those who need the coverage most might not be covered. I have a map here which shows that coverage today of social protection programs and insurance programs tends to be extremely low in Africa, but also in South Asia. The report has eight questions, and what I would very much like for you to do is then come after the presentation to me, and I sell these reports. But hopefully I can entice you to download the report for free and actually look at some of these questions, whether growth strategies or job strategies are important when, uh, as well as how policies can contribute to social cohesion. Let me talk about two questions quickly. Skills or jobs, what comes first? Very often um, we think about skill mismatches, leading public policy to be focused on, need to, needing to be focused on skill building and education systems. The question though is, where do these mismatches come from? As I said earlier, do they really come from the educational training system or do they come from the product market, from how the private sector uh, can grow? What is taught matters a lot. Social skills are increasingly important. So just focusing on technical skills in today's globalized world will not get us to where we want to be. So we think actually that skills can need, jobs need skills. They need a base of good skills, education, secondary education. They can pull skills by creating opportunities and demand for jobs. They can build skills themselves especially at the early time of work experience, which is very important for many young people. And in some circumstances, skills are necessary to boost innovation in jobs, especially, as I talked before, in, in the Bangladesh case, where the country wants to move up the value of it. Lastly, can entrepreneurship be fostered? Again, many of you are working on entrepreneurship programs, and we take the focus I explained earlier on micro-enterprises and look at household surveys across the world and try to ask the question, well, of those billions of micro-enterprises, what is the potential of job creation and poverty reduction? And we come up with a finding that there is about 10% of micro-enterprises across countries, very average number, that have the possibility to grow, where the owners have the education, the skill, where they're in the right location, and they have the right attitudes. The question then becomes how to reach them and with what to reach them. If we were to distribute credit and training widely, then most of the micro-enterprises who get these funds or training would not succeed. And the WDR talks about possibilities of really finding these micro-enterprises that have the possibility to reduce poverty and also
to create employment. So let me leave you with these, uh, with these thoughts. I went a little bit over time. I'm German, so uh, uh, I'm not, that's, a, that's a bad excuse because we normally tend to be on time. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm very much looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesko, for a very fascinating presentation with a great deal of energy for those of us who are jet lagged. That was very, very important. Uh, and uh, we'll forgive you uh, this one time for going over the, the time limit. Um, but you did provide us, thank you, Jesko, with a really, really important overview of what the latest research on jobs show. This is the research on jobs. This is what the academics and the findings uh, from various studies across the world show. But we're fortunate to have with us on the panel for people who actually worry about these sorts of issues in their day jobs all the time and advise and devise policies um, to increase the rights of jobs. And we've um, tried to carefully invite them to represent four of the different typologies that Yesco presented of different types of countries. Again, the job challenges in different parts of the world are very different. There is no magic bullet for jobs. There is no one size that fits all countries, or even within a country, every situation or every group. And that, I think, is the, the question that we'd like to have. Just a bit of perspective, linking back to my opening remarks. Just to place this in perspective. Why are we talking about jobs in this conference, besides the fact that that's on the mind of every political leader? It is because for the populations that we serve, jobs provide the resilience, the ability to bounce back from the shock that hits. The jobs provide that space, that ability to then recover. And, perhaps even more importantly, the right kinds of jobs provide opportunities, as Yesko said, of improving the productivity and the incomes of the person working and of their families. So with that perspective in mind, I would ask one question to each one of our panelists. They're under the un unhappy, we have a group of very unhappy panelists, I must warn <laughs> because I've asked them to uh, confine their remarks to only five minutes each, and I've warned them that I was a uh, very rude colleague uh, by, by enforcing the time limit. And that is for a particular reason. So please don't embarrass me, because the reason is that I want you to be part of this conversation as well. So, while we are speaking, please think about questions you want to ask of the panel, or to reflect on Yesco's presentation and see whether some of the job challenges you face in your country um, resonate or you disagree. Um, and that would be an important part of the conversation afterwards. Uh, but mostly, we would like to use the panel that's here. So I'm going to actually start um, with <coughs> So, Governor, you're from it, yeah? but your work covers all the countries of South Asia. And every country in South Asia, as, uh, as Governor Jesko mentioned, there is this great move from rural to urban. This region is growing fast and it's urbanizing fast. And Jesko mentioned that that will bring the need to create jobs that are productive for the, a huge number of people, and especially for women. Yes, we also mentioned that for India, labor regulations seem to be a major factor from the analysis of the WDR in restricting the spread of foreign sector jobs. So, Kamala, is that the solution? Is the solution to create the right sorts of jobs <coughs> In India, in South Asia, removal of the restricted labor uh, Thank you, Arun. I'm going to speak fast, I guess, to stick my uh, five minutes. 
Um, so just first of all, let me put some, uh, give you all some facts uh, to put this question that he asked in a broader perspective. Some of you may be familiar with this, but for some uh, it may not be that familiar. So it's useful for us to just get on the same page. Over the last quarter century, 25 years, the number of urban dwellers in South Asia more than doubled from something like 240 million to just under 500 million. In India alone, the urban population has grown by 122 million. And whereas in 1990, the region had just one mega city, uh, which was Mumbai, it now has five. Delhi, Karachi, Kolkata, and Dhaka have joined Mumbai uh, in having populations of more than 10 million. And yet, despite these impressive sounding figures, urbanization in South Asia has barely begun. Uh, so, so in a sense, South Asia is standing on the brink of an urban uh, revolution. By 2030, an additional 315 million South Asians will call cities their home, and India's urban population will have reached 600 million, which is uh, twice the entire population of the United States, and actually comparable to the urbanization rate that took place in China. So, fast urbanization is just is very likely to be accompanied by structural change, as it has been in the past um, 25 years in, in South Asia. So that's one fact. The second is on how has South Asia produced uh, jobs. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about it in the afternoon, but most of South Asia's um, uh, growth in labor productivity has been from total factor productivity and not factor accumulation. So going forward, our, our uh, point is that a lot of South Asia's um, growth in productivity has to come through factor accumulation. But there's one other source of TFP growth which hasn't been exploited, and that is labor reallocation from sectors. Um, as the WDR points out, labor reallocation across sectors has been a major driver of productivity growth in East Asia. In contrast, out-migration from, from agriculture is lagging in India. The share of agriculture and employment is estimated to be something like 14 percentage points above what would be expected uh, at India's level of per capita GDP, which reflects the limited absorption of labor into the non-agricultural economy. And the third fact I want to put as background is something that Jesko uh, mentioned but is uh, also discussed in greater detail in the WDR, as well as in the earlier report that we had done on South Asia, which is the distribution of manufacturing employment across firm size groups in India, which has persisted over time. 80% of manufacturing employment in 2005 was in micro enterprises, which is one to four workers, and small, five, five to 49. And that same distribution exists to this day, more or less unchanged. Um, so with that, those are the three background points. I have three related points to respond to the question that Arup asked me. First is that the non-farm economy will be the first port of a call in the exit from agriculture. Growth in per capita consumption in urban areas, especially in small towns, is increasingly associated with growth in rural non-farm employment, in particularly salaried and self-employment activities, not casual wage labor which is, you know, paid the least in the rural non-farm economy. So, the provision of public goods in small urban towns, which is, you know, urban public policy, is important in facilitating the exit from agriculture. That's point number one. The second is that urban informal micro-firms, which are likely to provide jobs for these rural out-migrants, um, are concerned. What are, we've asked them, what are your main concerns? Next to reliable power supply, which tops everybody's concerns, regardless of the type of firm, size of firm, location of firm. Urban in, um, um, informal micro firms say access to land and transport are the two main obstacles that they face. So, for example, density regulations which limit the ratio of floor space to plot area and lead cities to expand outwards rather than upwards, these are the kinds of things that need to be looked at. Limited access to public transport and so on. So, um, basic point is that improving these aspects of the business environment need to be policy priorities for job creation. So, um, first on urban public policy, second on access to land and transport. But, that said, there is some evidence of barriers to expansion coming from looking at the business environment which are facing urban formal sector firms. 
There, there too, as I said before, the concerns about electricity and corruption are the dominant concerns. But enterprise managers in India report labor legislation to be an important constraint to operation and growth of their business. In, in, in indeed, reported levels of severity are higher than other countries at India's level of, of development. And when we asked uh, firms which labor regulations most affected their operation, um, their operations, nearly one in three of them said uh, it's the regulations um, that are, I mean, the restrictions on dismissal uh, are a constraint on hiring. And, um, you know, some of them cited restrictions on casual work, some, of, some yet others cited constraints on temporary work, etc. So my point simply is that it, it's, it's probably true that, so, that from the surveys that we see that labor legislation is not the main cause or the main constraint. And ultimately, it may also be the case that if you did improvements in infrastructure and skills and other business regulations are streamlined and made less burdensome, that labor regulations themselves might become uh, less relevant. But that said, I, 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 I will contend that they're still, as they exist, they provide a source of corruption and a source of uh, unproductive rent-seeking activities, which uh, you know, as long as they remain, they can be used in that, mis abused in that way. They're also likely to be a constraint on FDI. We talked about exporting firms, uh, um, and um, which may tend to be export-focused investment from FDI. But more generally, I think I want to pick up something that Jesco and Renata uh, Ben said earlier, which is, I think the time has come to recognize that informal is normal, and that we need to focus much more attention to concerted efforts to reform these laws in a way that protect workers and not jobs. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kalpana, for uh, this very, very comprehensive answer, where you talked about both where labor regulations can be a source uh, for barriers to development, but also where for which groups they may not matter, and the need for other policies um, to be complementary to them um, in order to make the right kind of jobs and have access to higher productivity for the rural non-farm sector and for uh, microenterprises. And these are, I think, lessons that we should keep in mind as we go forward in this conference. Let me turn then to a very different sort of country. Yeah. In Yemen, the political and social situations are stabilizing, um, Mr. Alabama. Bellamy, pardon me. Um, but you have a large population of young people who um, are seeking opportunities, who are seeking jobs, who are unhappy at the prospects that they face today. And of course, part of it, as Jesko said, part of the challenge is, of course, to have an education system that equips them with the right skills. And there are important reforms in the education system that many of the countries represented here, not only Yemen, face. But many of them are out of the education system right now. They have gone through schoolings, they have a skill set, they can't find the jobs. What do you see as the solution for those young people who have left the education system but yet need to find jobs. Thank you very much. That's really true. In fact, our country now is emerging out of unstable and complex situation. And uh, of course, there is not a single answer or cure word for that, but let me say that uh, we have an approach, let's say, uh, that think with people, think with their own, but uh, rather than thinking for them, okay? Um, what we see as the practical and realistic approach to deal with employment, uh, uh, unemployment of the youth, especially those who are unskilled, is to give them the opportunity to participate, to engage in certain business. In fact, uh, the um, community-based community uh, public works is an opportunity in which you try to have a kind of quick wins under a fragility of the state and uh, instability situation, but also increasingly giving the opportunity for them to engage in their first job and also to subsidize uh, um, 
training uh, opportunity to gain some skills, life skills, and also other uh, uh, skills. But also, this is to be combined in a kind of uh, integrated manner, if possible, with, with other means of improving their access to finance and then financial services that might allow them to develop their own businesses. So the key a strategy here is to uh, uh, transfer them into a kind of self-employment. In fact, uh, this is not special in Yemen, but it is even more uh, in Yemen that uh, uh, those who are employed already are employed, more than 97% of them are uh, employed in an uh, informal sector, you see. so mostly uh, employing themselves. We have, we have uh, uh, evidence from the public works, the community-based public works that the, the activities we launch provide the, the opportunity for some, some kind of linkages between the workers, the, the contractors, the consultants, the, the, the suppliers of certain uh, uh, materials, and also the, the uh, earned money also allows uh, the, the youth to, to uh, establish their own businesses through the purchased some small machines, sometimes for cutting stone or for, uh, I mean, uh, motorcycles or for uh, uh, carpentry. So the people, they can find themselves if they have been given the chance to do the way to facilitate uh, uh, their access to knowledge, their access to, to finance. Um, certain uh, uh, programs, have, training programs have been launched also, especially the, the uh, development of entrepreneurship for the youth. You, maybe all of you, you know the CAP. Uh, of course, this is the uh, know about business, because it's a kind of orientation that tries to influence the thinking of the youth towards self-employment. So uh, thousands of youth have been trained uh, in this course and also other courses. And uh, the graduates have also more access to finance, to microcredit, almost without any kind of difficult guarantees that you have to, to, uh, to, to provide. Maybe uh, except for the, the address and maybe some informal guarantees. So it, it tends to be more and more uh, integrated. Uh, but uh, at the same time, there's a kind of maybe, I shouldn't say trade off, but I mean, you need to, to widen the coverage of such operations as to uh, try to, to, to be fair with all regions and this it does demand uh, um, sufficient funding and also sufficient uh, human resources. So I mean, we have to live with that and try to prioritize the interventions um, between one region and another, between one time and another. That's what I think. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, the comments. And I want to pick up and contrast a bit with what Yesco said. Uh, some very interesting facts you've talked about. Uh, training for the informal sector. Now, yes, we talked about training, and the characteristics that we see from research where training works better as training connected to the private sector, right, where the private sector has an influence on determining what skills are being provided. For the self-employed, for the single person employed, of course, there is no private sector skills demand that you're meeting. And so what you talked about is how to equip these young people with the knowledge and skills to employ themselves productively. And that's a specific type of training that's you. And you also mentioned, and that of course picks up on what Yesco said, that for a country like yours with high youth unemployment, there is a need for um, social transfers, such as through public works programs, but that can lead to more productive opportunities if combined with the other types of training that not only provide the transfers, not only provide the cash, but also gives them the ability to move up into the productivity chain. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before we, we, we can let us some data on the characteristics of the participating members in the public works in the communities by the way, and, 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 and even in the FMPDS. And based on that, we designed some uh, training packages that might prepare them for longer term uh, employment, whether it is self employment or even formal somehow. We will be, of 
but it's not. I would like to say that because of these labor market, uh, labor, active labor uh, measures, we have uh, stabilized the unemployment figures in 13.2, 13.3%. No, it's not that. It's because of the economical uh, development in Albania. Why is that? Because of the tax incentive in Albania. We have that very simple 10% for everyone, and we are paying too much attention on the incentives given, especially for FDIs. But not only, everybody is profiting. But our intention is that one. And we are too much investing in infrastructure. I forgot to say that just 1% less than half of the population, meaning 49% of the population, is living in the living and working in, in the rural area. So meaning that not having too much access to the market. And that's why we invested too much in infrastructure, in the roads, in the building. And just because of that, now our country, it's really small, but it's smaller because of the infrastructure and everybody can get access to uh, the market. And because of 50% of the population living in the rural areas, we have to take care about that. And those are small ones, very small economies. Almost everybody is living with the stripes of the lands, but they have a lot of opportunities. And what they were missing is because of the market. They were producing, but they were not interested to produce more because the market was so uh, far. Now we are uh, less or small country with the infrastructure and they are interested to have more uh, production. And we are now launching new policies encouraging uh, so-called social enterprises and uh, uh, social business. We believe that business and market economy is strong, but there are some deviations and social enterprises, social businesses can be fostering and can fight some of the social problems like poverty, unemployment, but not only, even the environmental issues and the health issues uh, taking care of that. Those were, let's say, kind of the all the incentives that we are paying attention. But we're investing as the priority in the IT. Almost every sector of the economy in Albania is now being part of the uh, investment in Albania, uh, of the uh, in informational uh, technology. We are just finishing now all the procedures for the employment offices, employment services, and uh, with the World Bank experts, we are working now for MIS, uh, for the social assistance scheme, and hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully that 1.2% uh, it was in 2008, uh, we will get that uh, by zero, by the finishing of this, or starting to work with the new formula in the opinion for social assistance scheme. Those were more or less. Thank you very much, Mr. Suka. And again, you brought some very, very important echoes of the WDR, but some, uh, um, I want to highlight one other important point. The echo you brought, of course, is that labor market policies and active labor market policies, even though you actually run them, you see as not the solution. It is the broader policy environment, something that also was signaled by Kalpana, that really these policies don't fit into. If the jobs aren't there, what's the point of trying to connect people to jobs or to train them for jobs? And there, uh, I think the second point you made that is a very powerful point that I think all of us have to keep in mind is that jobs are about, to, the policies to build jobs are about connecting people. Connecting people to markets, connecting people to information, connecting people to each other. And that's the agglomeration effects that uh, Jesko was talking about. And what you pointed out was that it doesn't just have to be agglomeration effects from cities. In a smaller country like Albania, building the IT technology, building the roads, making the connections happen to link people to markets and to each other 
can have a job generating effect of its own. And so this was a very powerful uh, variation, perhaps, of the theme that Yesco had talked about. Last but not least, um, let me turn south <laughs> from, from Albania to Liberia. And Mr. Tene, Liberia has had a very successful emergence from a very difficult past. You are starting a new page in your history in some ways, emerging from conflict and strife and building a new nation. But there have been wounds from that conflict that also need to be addressed. And one of the main ways to address this is the aspiration that people feel to find opportunities and find jobs so that they don't go back to the old ways. So can you give us a sense, given that, of course, in this post-conflict environment, there aren't that many jobs around. So how do you see the jobs challenge in your country in a post-conflict context when there aren't that many jobs around? Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I will answer your questions before I begin by throwing a few numbers at you, which reflects our um, challenges in Liberia, and then go down to policy frameworks that we have set up um, to promote job growth, and some of the initiatives that we have taken to especially deal with the high youth unemployment. So in Liberia currently about, um, like he said, we are a small country, so numbers we draw out are very significant to us. Um, we have like um, 850,000 people in Liberia who are unemployed. So you see bulk of our um, large proportion of the population um, need for its, um, public assistance. We have of the active um, folks um, in the labor market, 70% of those who are taken are in the formal sector. So we are left with are in the informal sector. We are left with just 5%, which is not 195,000 people in the uh, former sector. So um, in our incomes, income is low. We have large um, informal sector, as I said, with a generally low skill. Vulnerability is high, which, in, which increases as crucial to shock and rate. And then you have, in terms of uh, contributory social insurance, you got, which is limited um, in, a, in a very small former sector. So what we've done is that in order to solve some of these problems coming from a post, some of these challenges um, coming from a post, uh, in a post-conflict environment, we've been able to put social protection as uh, a priority in our development agenda. So social protection is incorporated in our, what we call transformation, agenda for transformation, which is our poverty reduction strategy too. And this is under within our, our vision 2030, which um, uh, which is geared toward making Liberia a middle income country in the year 2030. And so social protection is within our agenda for transformation under the human development pillar and it's focusing on addressing the issue of uh, focusing on social assistance and addressing vulnerability and employment. And we've been able to develop a social protection strategy and policy that will provide social safety net to vulnerable household um, through public works, uh, cash transfer to increase income opportunity. We've also been able to provide, to pass, um, after lingering in the parliament for uh, quite a long time, we've been able to provide, pass the um, decent work bill, which is not able to create the environment for workers to obtain decent work and also negotiate uh, better wages. So those are some of the policy um, framework and, and legal policy and legal framework we have initiated. But the government has prioritized youth employment because um, a, a bulk of our family, uh, our population especially, is a young population and unemployment is huge among the youth population. So the government is prioritizing um, youth employment. And in doing so, we had, I mean, the money is not much, but we have in our own national budget, we have uh, allotted 15 million targeted towards creating jobs for youth and also providing some training. And 
our focus is more on providing job, and then we're doing this imaginary, but please placing more focus on the job. And another thing we've done is that when the president took over um, in the second time, um, she had a 150-day deliverable. In a 150-day deliverable, most of the focus were on youth employment. So we were able to create 7,000 jobs, a uh, short-term job, through public work scheme throughout the countries. So people were, we, we had to put few people to jobs, doing short-term jobs, and stuff like that. We also had the Youth Employment and Skill Program um, supported by the World Bank, which have already created 31,900 jobs, and uh, jobs and training for young people. The goal of this program is to reach um, 52,000 by 52,000 uh, young people um, by, the, uh, by the year to June of 2013. And we're, we're trying to um, implement a pilot program of the social cash transfer, of a social cash transfer program. We've done one uh, county successfully, and we're now expanding to another county with the goal of covering the entire country because we realize that Liberia is not going to reach a middle income status if we leave the vulnerable folks behind. So we want to make sure that we're all moving together. Um, so yeah, those are some of the priorities in me getting our situation, being a post-conflict a post country. Thank you uh, again, Mr. Tenetene. What a, what a big challenge and how very thoughtfully you're addressing this. But one of the interesting points that, uh, again, the WDR mentions that you are actually implementing is that public works programs in these sorts of situations form a basic element of social cohesion in a country that needs healing, that needs to feel the promise in the future. Public works programs build that sort of social cohesion by providing the sorts of opportunities that people are seeking uh, rather than having been disillusioned. And I think it's also really important uh, to understand that with 5% of the population in the formal sector, the jobs challenge is not going to be there. For the next generation, it is about how to make the informal sector more productive and find opportunities there. And that is, in many of your countries, I think, the challenge. So now I want to first, by the way, quickly thank the panel who, despite the unhappiness, were very disciplined. So thank you very much. I now want to turn the challenge over to you in the audience. Can we bring the house lights back up, please? Because this is going to really be about the audience. There are mics, um, I think, in these two corners. Can we? Is it possible to turn the lights back up here? Lovely. As you see, the, the focus now is back on you, not on us. Uh, so we can rest. I'm going to give, ask those of you with remarks but questions to the panel to actually, there are these two mics there. Can you, uh, those of you with questions, come up in these two mics and offer some questions, preferably, or brief remarks? Who's going to be brave? Please. And there will be colleagues who can help. But there's a mic here and the mic there in the back, in front of the pillar. Can others please stand up and come? Yeah, there are many, many other mics, right? So you see, I can't see the mics, but there are many mics, so please. Do keep your remarks short, though, uh, so that uh, I don't un uh, I'd not be unfair to a panelist. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Do introduce yourself. I first would uh, introduce myself. I belong to the Moroccan delegation. Uh, I'm working in a job promotion agency and skill development. Uh, I'm leading, uh, let's say, the biggest agency in Casablanca since Casablanca is the most outstanding economy city in Morocco. But if you don't mind, I'm going back to the 15 minutes break we had since we had advice that we should share with others. I found myself on dealing with social and political issues rather than economic issues. And this might reflect that economical health is not a matter to be taken as single. It should be combined with social, political, 
policies, and this is, I think, uh, this is something obvious today. Because when we're talking about jobs, job depends on economical health, and there is not typology, as you said, I mean, of uh, bringing, let's say, an experience from another country and implementing it in another country. But the differences in the country's cultures, in the culture, uh, economic resources, richness, and so on and so forth. But the main point we all have been, I mean, agreeing about is the formal and informal sectors. And as we see still, the reflection can go deeper and deeper uh, regarding the informal sector. Which informal sector are we talking about? Because there are so many different informal sectors. Those bring in high gain and those bring in just low cost and low salaries. Uh, for example, uh, I'm not going to introduce I mean, any example of my country, but I mean, the focal point of me is that to see and to push a reflection together to find a key solution regarding the shift from the informal to formal sector. And here maybe I'm doing a call state governments. I mean, to the truth, as we say in French, and think about solution regarding this. Because this is going to be a good investment, bringing a higher return of investments. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for your reflections. I want to encourage others to do that before we turn back to the panel for their reflections. Come on, you can't be that shy. Please, just come up and line up next to the microphone and I'll recognize you. Please. Don't, please, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you may be failing the test uh, already in this, early in the conference if you're not participating. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, my name is Ramses Mboya, I'm from Liberia. Uh, I had the Librarian Education, Librarian Agency for Community Empowerment, and we implement the Public Works Project in Liberia. Um, I've been thinking about the presentation made by the Chief Presenter on Public Works Projects. In Liberia, the problem we have is how do we change the minds of the young people from thinking about getting jobs in government? And then basically everybody thinks that they must get job in government. So we want to draw, we want to learn from the uh, uh, from the group here, from the participant here, uh, impose immediate past post-conflict countries. Can that be strategies that government or implementing partners can use to change the psyche of the uh, the unemployed youth? Um, nowadays there are a lot of anxieties. Um, all the programs that the minister talked about are on the way. But people still think that if they graduate from college, uh, they go through some vocational training, they should get job in government. Uh, the whole definition of what employment is, is one of the things that needs to be taught through. How do we get the people to think that thinking that self-employment is indeed employment? Thank you. Thank you very much. Other thoughts? Please.
Euh, il y a une autre remarque concernant M. Gesco. Il a parlé ce matin de destruction, la destruction de l'emploi. Au fait, on pense toujours comment créer de l'emploi. Et il me semble qu'il euh, faut en même temps créer comment maintenir les emplois. Parce que créer un emploi sans le maintenir, ça ne résout pas le problème. Une autre chose, on parle toujours de croissance, qui est un facteur ou bien un vecteur qui va permettre de créer de l'emploi. Mais l'expérience en Tunisie a montré qu'on avait un taux de croissance de 5 à 5,5%, alors qu'après la révolution, le taux de chômage était très élevé. Donc il faut toujours lier croissance avec développement. Et nous sommes. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Um, can I perhaps the last uh, intervention from the audience? Okay. Hola, van a tener que cambiar los traductores. Soy Mariela Jode, directora nacional de Economía Social del Ministerio de Desarrollo Social de Uruguay. Eh, representación de mi país, para mí es un orgullo estar acá y agradezco la oportunidad. Eh, simplemente una o dos reflexiones con respecto a la gran preocupación y ocupación que tenemos con respecto al tema del, traba, del empleo y trabajo. Primera reflexión, el trabajo es el gran estructurador para nosotros como seres humanos, nos estructura, ¿verdad? El desempleado, creo que eso es un común denominador, no es desempleado sobre todo en los sectores que estamos analizando por una opción, sino por una serie de condiciones socioeconómicas y políticas, de acuerdo a cada país y a cada cultura, que condicionan ¿verdad? esta situación. Eso eh, en primer lugar. ¿Por qué señalo esto? Porque creo que eh, de las distintas presentaciones eh, absolutamente eh, respetables, creo que nosotros deberíamos no poner solo en el foco en lo que tiene que ver con eh, la persona desempleada, sino también analizar las causas para luego eh, tomar las medidas y programas que, como bien se decía, no son mágicas las soluciones, sino que si bien hay eh, factores comunes en los distintos programas que he escuchado, independientemente de los países en los cuales provenimos, eh, tenemos la tendencia a depositar la responsabilidad de la salida de la exclusión a justamente eh, el sector más desprotegido que son los desempleados. Entonces creo que también tenemos que poner el énfasis cuando hablamos de competencias, cuando hablamos de capacitación para el trabajo, en las competencias transversales que ubican a la persona en Construir, construir ciudadanía, ese ejercicio que tiene que ver con la autoestima, pero también a la hora de emplearse, así sea la autogestión a través de cooperativas o así sea de relación de dependencia y término, qué rol, qué papel juegan las empresas con la responsabilidad social bien entendida y no el marketing social como estamos acostumbrados, por lo menos en los países de América Latina, en los países donde las empresas este, buscan como excusa el marketing social cuando les conviene y eh, nos parece importante en este ámbito también ver qué lugar le ponemos entonces a esa responsabilidad que tienen las empresas, los empleadores, cuando tienen gente que quizás está en un nivel eh, eh, bajo, digamos, pero con, un, con una oportunidad, eh, son los mejores trabajadores y tenemos muestras de buenas prácticas al respecto que da muestra de esto. Muchas gracias. Gracias y thank you very much for that intervention. Let's have one last intervention and then I will try and Buenos días. Español también. Quisiera agradecer, bueno, la invitación primero, segundo, soy Marco Solís, 
de Argentina, soy el director nacional de la Comisión de Microcrédito del Ministerio de Desarrollo Social de la Nación y quería hacer un comentario breve sobre, el, por ahí principalmente sobre lo que Yesco ha desarrollado en su ponencia, ahí se, se hacía mención a que una de las condiciones para la inclusión social y, los, y, le, y aumentar los niveles de protección social tenía que ver con el equilibrio macroeconómico, creo que el informe lo señalaba claramente, y la reflexión por ahí iba por ese lado, este, a mi entender y, y en lo que respecta a mi país, Argentina, este, no cualquier equilibrio macroeconómico genera mejores instancias o niveles de inclusión y protección social y genera mejores oportunidades para el sector de la economía informal. Hemos sufrido nosotros en Argentina en los años 90 un equilibrio macroeconómico brillante en muchos países desarrollados en Argentina ya el primer mundo y el sector informal crecía desmesuradamente, se achicaba el desempleo y se agrandaba el sector informal. O sea que la disminución del desempleo no garantiza, no garantiza por sí mismo la inclusión de estos sectores excluidos. Por lo tanto, la reflexión era qué condiciones debe tener o debe tener también condiciones la política económica y la macroeconomía para generar mejores escenarios para la inclusión del sector de la economía informal. Este, en suma, a mí me parece que este, el desarrollo de determinados tipos de políticas económicas vinculadas al ajuste, a la reducción del gasto público, este, a otro montón de condiciones que hacen que muchos recursos que podrían emplearse en la incorporación de la economía, de la economía informal se destinen hacia generar esos equilibrios macroeconómicos. Por lo tanto, este, la reflexión era no cualquier equilibrio macroeconómico genera posibilidades de inclusión de la economía informal. Si no van juntos, me parece que uno gasta mucho esfuerzo en generar esos niveles de protección y de inclusión, pero si la economía, el modelo productivo económico de ese, del país que se trate, no acompaña a eso, los esfuerzos son bastante limitados. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you for these very, very important perspectives on the topics we are discussing. I'm, I'm very conscious of time, and I know that you want to get out and have lunch. So what I'm going to ask Jesko and the panel, and Jesko, you may want to grab a mic, is to respond to anything that you may have heard. Uh, not, there were not particular questions addressed to you. Um, but feel free to give further reflections on what you've heard. Um, yes, go. do you want to start off? Sure. So, should I start? Sure, Mr. Silke. Just a quick um, intervention regarding to the private and governmental jobs. It's quite common from the countries that are coming from the centralized economy, uh, ex-socialist uh, countries that are with the population that are used to have the eyes on the government. What are the jobs? Where are the jobs? You have to create this kind of the jobs because they were used to. The answer for this one, it is according to our experience. Very small government, central government, small one. Everybody could see that no many, many ministers. In our country we have only 14 for the first time. Privatizing. Most part of the economy is privatized. Everybody could see. No more um, public and, uh, you know, uh, kind of the economic activities that are for the sake of employment. Not anymore. And usually we used to have uh, a public university, a public hospital, and public schools. Not anymore. The most part of this kind of these services are provided by the private uh, universities, private schools, private hospitals. So everybody now sees that you can have this kind of the jobs in the private sector. And the old generation still are asking for this kind of the governmental jobs. New generations, mostly these that 
have already degrees from the university, they know for sure that where is the private one, they can find the jobs. And that's kind of the relations with the jobs from the government and the private one, according to my experience. Thank you. Okay, again to this point. The public vis-a-vis -vis private opportunities for, for employment. Entrepreneurship tends to be sometimes as a kind of culture. And we think that um, uh, youth needs to, need to build their attitude towards, towards uh, uh, establishing their own businesses. This could be mainstream in the educational system, for instance. And, and um, the opportunity will be even greater once they see good examples, successful examples for youth making their own business, making their own success. Unless being inspired with good examples, they will still uh, expect the government to employ them. Uh, in the case of South Asia and particularly India, which um, the point about the great urgency, uh, uh, Ono mentioned numbers in the morning of a um, million eight hundred and fifty thousand to a million people entering the labor force uh, every month. This is now a really urgent issue that needs to be dealt with in the smaller and it cannot be, um, you know, this, this number of people cannot be accommodated in the already existing urban centers is just gone past the stage of the benefits of agglomeration and quickly entering the, the, um, the disadvantages of congestion. So it has to be through the development of secondary cities that are closer to the rural um, areas. And for that, infrastructure, 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 and all kinds, and that's, that's the number one uh, uh, message. And then the second uh, issue, I just wanted to put back on the table a very important point that Renanabad made in the morning, which was the uh, kinds of reforms that are needed to recognize, for example, this very large number of street vendors in, in, in India which, who are now illegal. It's a stroke of a pen reform, it's not even a question of building any infrastructure and, and really needs to be done. At, um, through just, I think, political will. Thank you. <coughs> Unfortunately, my mic, my translator was not working, so I managed to pick up only on the English. <laughs> um, but I think I agree with um, the first speaker when he's talking about the political context. I mean, there has to be, there has to be a political environment set to, in, to support job creation. In the absence of that, it is quite difficult to create job itself. Um, Larry, if I may, thank you so much for, for these uh, comments. Just three quick, uh, quick observations. The first is to, to, to growth uh, and, and also macro stability, which we then heard from our Argentine colleague. <coughs> I, I, I think I'm actually very much in line with, with both of your comments in the sense that we believe that jobs actually are one of the instruments for the world. So, sorry. Um, so it's, it's not only growth to jobs, but it's also jobs to growth so that we understand these. On macro stability for sorry, there's a problem with the translation. Yes, sorry, the I think you have to turn off your mics. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
Um, so just so on the on the on the growth comment, completely taking your point, we're trying to look at actually how do jobs drive development and not only growth leading to to jobs. Um, second, on macro stability in in, in Argentina, a uh, point very well taken. I think there are different macro uh, stabilities. What we're talking about there is really a non-inflationary environment, which is the, the fundamental for uh, the, the, the jobs policies, having a debt situation which doesn't go completely out of bounds. Um, so many of the things which firms need in order to be able to invest. The question which I think our Liberian colleague and then also from, from Uruguay we heard is that uh, you said uh, jobs build Sudania. And I think this is one of the themes we're very interested in in the report, how do jobs change these norms and behaviors and also aspirations. So in the Liberia context, the question was how do jobs, how can aspirations be changed of not getting a job in the public sector? And there, I think one of the core questions is how are demonstration effects working in Cambodia in a post-conflict environment that actually created safe economic zones, and maybe all Cambodian colleagues can talk about that, where they brought together security plus in investment space that had private sector take the lead and which had a real big impact on job creation, but also in terms of changing aspirations in the um, Cambodian context. And the last point uh, on the structure and creation of work, uh, these structural changes are really the drivers for productivity. So to a certain degree, we, we need to embrace it. Um, destruction should not happen if these are productive jobs. And in one part of the report, we actually talk about the circumstances under which job protection is important. However, in general, the movement towards productive firms is something which is important for countries in which social policies and social insurance policies can support, which is one of the themes of the, uh, this conference. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jessica. It is hard to summarize this discussion, but I'm going to try anyway, <laughs> and point to perhaps a few things that came out of this conversation, and that perhaps will be reflected in the conversations to come. First, and this is important to think about, is that for creating opportunity, one of the themes of the conference, for creating pathways to jobs, Labor market policies are important. In mathematical terms, they may be necessary, but they are by no means sufficient. Where the challenge is to create jobs, and two things came out in the various discussions about what are the challenges that countries' broad policies need to tackle. As I said before, the challenge of connectedness, making sure whether it's infrastructure, 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 whether it's IT, to connect people to the jobs, whether it's information, and the active labor market policies play a role. Can you have access to jobs not because your cousin's sister has a friend who says that there's a job available, in which case if you don't have the right cousin or the right cousin's sister, you have a problem. Or is there no public way of knowing that there is a job available that actually asks for your skills? Second broad policy is though, and that addresses some of the questions at the last part of the debate, is one of predictability. For a firm to create jobs, or a self-employed person to invest in their future, they need to know what that future holds in some way. That's where macro stability comes in. If you don't know what the inflation rate is going to be, what the prices at which you're going to sell your produce is going to be two days from now, two months from now, a year from now, then there's a problem. If there's regulatory uncertainty, if you don't know how the regulations are going to change sometime from now, there's uncertainty. If you don't know about safety, if you don't know whether what you produce will not be expropriated or looted or there'll be a bribe asked that you haven't anticipated in the production function, then you will not be able to create jobs. So again, that's where the job creation agenda has to fit in with the broader aspects 
of connectivity and predictability. And then, within those contexts, both for the informal and the formal sectors, there are measures that we discussed earlier. So, I would like to get into the topics of this conference. There are four areas, as you may have seen already, from the schedule before you that we will explore, really starting in earnest from this afternoon. First, we talked a lot about the informal sector. And the, as Yesko said, in many, many of our countries, informal is normal. We may aspire towards more formal jobs. We may believe strongly that that is the way things should be. But the reality is that for millions of millions of people in our countries, that reality may not come in their lifetimes, or it may only come for their children. So in that sense, we have to think about what to do for the people today, and that's about policies that can increase the productivity of the informal sector, whether these stroke of the pen regulations that I talked about and uh, that was talked about earlier today, or whether the particular training programs or skills programs or public works programs that can equip people to either protect them from risks or to provide them opportunity. The second pillar of this conference is going to be actually on managing risks because for social protection to provide the opportunities, we have to try and make sure that one sudden unexpected shock doesn't wipe out years and years of accumulation, accu accumulated productivity and the parts that need to run. So if you lose your job, what happens? Does it mean that you and your children are devastated for a lifetime? Are there policies? that can stop that, that can help people with these shocks. If there's a health risk, what does that mean? How can we prevent people from still getting the opportunity? If there is uh, a risk that comes from a sudden flood or a hurricane or an earthquake, how can we help people recover? Those are the areas <coughs> where we have to talk about risk, managing risk as a second pillar of this conflict. The third pillar is about weight employment. So or with all the talk about uh, informal sector, in many countries, the formal sector is important. And in fact, that is the pathway to growth and productivity and overall growth, which will allow the country to have the resources to protect the poorest. So how do we have the pathways to weight employment for the most vulnerable people? People like you and I, presumably, have jobs and can get other jobs. For the vulnerable, there is a policy, public policy challenge, and that's part of the pathways. And finally, something that holds the most promise. This all sounds very difficult and very grim, but the real hope that we see is from technology. And the technology that we already heard from our Yemeni colleague, that we heard from our colleague in Albania, where the programs that are being developed today in your countries are programs that don't imitate what the Europeans or the Americans did 30 years or 40 years ago. These are programs that are using the latest technology available today and are in many characteristics much more advanced of today's industrialized countries because of the techniques that are used. And that's the hope, because that allows the information to spread, that allows governance to actually be enforced and corruption to be minimized by direct transfers, and that allows the efficiency that is needed for countries with very small budgets often in these programs to do this effectively. So I think the panel and you uh, from the international audience and UNESCO has set the grounds very nicely for the conversation we're going to have over the next few days. I very much look forward to that, um, and thank you all for participating, and again, thank you to the panel for a really, really thoughtful session. So, um, I guess there are um, lunch.